Welcome back to the Last Days Book Club, where we're reading the book entitled The Heavenly Man, the story of Brother Yun, a dramatic autobiography of one of China's courageous and intensely persecuted house church leaders, which will turn your heart to prayer and praise. The book is written by Paul Hathaway, who is the International Director of Asia Harvest, an organization committed to serve in the church throughout Asia. Permission to read this book has been granted by the holder of the audio rights, English publisher SPCK Group and Lion Hudson, trade names for the Society for Promoting Christian Knowledge. In our last reading, we covered chapter 9, entitled Through the Valley of Death where Yun was returned to his home village of Nanyang and imprisoned. He was weak and in great pain and negotiated with his captors to give him time to recuperate before being interrogated. He was granted this request since they believed he would confess. Instead, Yun went on a fast, not eating any food or drinking any water from January through March. During this time, he meditated constantly upon the Word of God. And despite his lack of food, God kept his spirit strong and viable, despite the fact that he was too weak to walk or even talk. Because he gave his food to his fellow prisoners, he was able to witness to them of Jesus and they saw in his survival the mighty arm of God. Toward the end of his fast, Yun had a vision in which he saw many iron gates opening and many people of multiple nationalities singing and worshipping God. And the voice of God reminded him in John 14.12 that greater things will he do that has faith in me. During this fast, Yun grew close to God, understanding that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. The word of God was indeed his life and sustenance, and the word spread among the prisoners and even beyond the prison walls that there was a miracle man who lived without eating. Throughout this ordeal, his pregnant wife, Diling, remained faithful to him, despite pressure from many relatives and family members to divorce him, since he would either be imprisoned for life or executed. We continue the story today with chapter 10, entitled, The Fiery Trial. This chapter, like many of the other chapters, begins with a scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Again, the chapter is entitled, The Fiery Trial. During the fast, I was very weak in my body, yet my spirit was alert, and I continued to trust in the Lord. I knew that His grace was sufficient for me. Because of what God had told me, I kept fasting longer than 40 days. I continued to pray constantly and sought God's forgiveness and mercy for my family, our church, our country, and for myself. 
I often quoted Psalms 123, verses 1 and 2. Unto thee lift I up mine eyes, O thou that dwellest in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of servants look unto the hand of their masters, and as the eyes of a maiden unto the hand of her mistress, so our eyes wait upon the Lord our God until that he have mercy upon us. In this way, God accepted my heart's desire to continue to fast and to pray. I entered into a very intense spiritual war, the kind of which I had never experienced before. Let me here take a moment to explain what it's like when I receive a dream or vision from the Lord. These don't happen frequently, but usually only when there is something important or urgent that God wants to impress on me. All the visions I've received are very short, often lasting just a second or two. Often a picture or scene flashes into my spirit and mind, yet it is so vivid and real that I know it from the Lord. As Christians, we're not to live by any vision or dream, nor should we seek after them. We must only live by the Word of God and seek the face of Jesus. But we should also be open to allow the Lord to speak to us in these ways, if this is how He wants to. Any vision or dream we receive needs to be carefully weighed against the Scriptures, as nothing from God will ever contradict His Word. God spoke to people through dreams and visions all the way through both the Old and New Testaments. In these times, the Bible declares, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. Joel chapter 2 and verse 28. Out of the various dreams and visions the Lord has given me over the years, only once or twice have I received a vision that I saw with my eyes open, an actual scene that was visible to my eye and not just an inward impression. One such vision happened on the fortieth night of my fast. I saw a great yellow sandstorm that had been whipped up from the desert. It carried a swarm of millions of poisonous hornets, vipers, scorpions and centipedes. The wind lifted the roof off my house. The foundations of my home stood firm even though the roof was lifted off and the walls cracked. The poisonous creatures started to attack me. At that moment in my vision, I turned around and saw a naked prostitute. She opened her shirt to expose herself and called out for me to come to her for refuge. I was confused. On the one hand, I longed to flee from the painful creatures that were stinging me, yet I didn't want to run into the arms of a prostitute. I wondered what I should do. Suddenly in my vision my mother appeared in front of me. Her face was shining and peaceful. She lovingly said, My son, lie down quickly. She gave me a large loaf of bread and instructed, Son, eat it immediately. Those thousands and thousands of hornets, snakes, scorpions and centipedes continued to attack my body. I couldn't stand the pain any longer. And I shouted, Lord, help me! My own voice awakened me from the vision. I found it was already midnight and I was still in the prison cell. The experience was so real 
that I could hardly believe it was only a vision. Later that night, after I had gone to sleep, I received another dream from the Lord. This one was brief, and I didn't comprehend its meaning. I saw myself carried away to a white-walled room. White sheets surrounded me. A man dressed in white clothes told me, Stretch out your hand on the sheet. When I did so, a red, bloody handprint appeared on the sheet. I didn't understand how it got there, because there was no ink or anything else on my hand. When I awoke, I couldn't figure out what this dream meant, but I knew the Lord would show me in due time. I put my hand on Brother Lee, who was next to me in the cell. I whispered, Tomorrow, I'm going to have another trial, and I will suffer more for Jesus. Please pray for me. Brother Lee mumbled something and fell back to sleep. At about 9 a.m. the next morning, I heard a voice calling, Bring Yun out! The steel hinges on our door creaked open. Brother Lee carried me to the interrogation room because I was too weak to walk. Lee was a new Christian. Before he came to the Lord, he was known as a violent man and a ruthless robber. He was assigned to watch me closely and to report everything I did to the guards. I knew the government had placed Lee in my cell as an informant. After living with me for some time, he realized I was just a Christian pastor. He saw the consistency of my life, and he witnessed God's sustaining power during my fast. He saw that I lived what I taught and was not a criminal. One day, as Lee carried me back to the cell, he leaned forward and whispered, I now believe in your Jesus. He became my very dear brother. Before the interrogation began, I sensed the Lord was standing beside me and was my strength and joy. As the psalmist wrote, I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. Psalms 16, verses 8 through 9. The more I meditated on God's grace, the more faith I received. As Brother Lee carried me, he prayed under his breath for I had told him a great trial awaited me. The officers directed him to place me on the ground. They told Brother Lee to sit down and wait. That day, two new officers came to interrogate me. I refused to talk. I just closed my eyes and lay down. One of the men kicked me and shouted, Yun, you will speak today. The other officer forced my eyelids open and said, Look around, Yun. We have methods to deal with people like you. If you don't want to speak, we'll make you. This time, they had brought various instruments of torture with them, including whips and chains. Another officer approached me with an electric baton. He turned the voltage up to the highest level and struck my face, head, and various parts of my body with it. Immediately, my body was filled with overwhelming agony, as if a thousand arrows had pierced 
my heart, the Holy Spirit encouraged me with three scriptures from the Bible. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 7. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. James chapter 1 and verse 12. By meditating upon the word of God, the Lord strengthened me to endure. I realized any suffering I was to go through was nothing compared to what Jesus had suffered for me, and that no pain I could ever experience was beyond the understanding and compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. The Lord didn't allow me to feel as much pain as I should have. The officers stood on my hands and my feet, electrocuting me again and again. They pulled my eyelids, lips, ears, and other body parts to humiliate me. I still refused to speak. I was a half-dead pile of skin and bones, lying motionless on the cold cement floor. Realizing the approach wasn't working, one officer suddenly changed his attitude and adopted a silk glove method. He said, stop, wait a minute. Young, I'll give you another chance. This day, if you admit your crimes against the government, we'll release you if you agree to attend a three self church. We can even let you become the chairman of the regional branch of the three self patriotic movement. We'll stop investigating your previous crimes and we'll forgive you. He kicked me again and asked, Yun, did you hear what I said? Do you accept my offer? Answer me, immediately. Before I opened my mouth to answer, I was reminded of the vision of the prostitute trying to lure me to safety. Suddenly my spirit was taken away from my body and I saw the vision again of the snakes, scorpions, hornets and centipedes that had attacked and almost killed me as I lay on the ground. I realized why God had shown me the vision the previous night. The officers tried brutality, then seduction, in an attempt to conquer me. But the Lord enabled me to repel their efforts. Seeing their methods were not producing the desired results, they instructed Brother Lee to carry me to the prison's medical clinic. A short, fat man, dressed in white, entered the room and told the four guards who had accompanied me, Please leave me alone as I examine Yun. After they left the room, the doctor told me, Yun, if you won't talk, I can make you talk. He smiled with an evil grin. This needle will help cure you of your problem. It will make you talk. The guards were called back in. 
They spread my hands and feet and held me down on the bed. Then they separated my fingers and held them palm down on a wooden board. The doctor took a large needle labeled number six from his back. He started with my left thumb. He jabbed the needle onto my fingernails one at a time. I can't describe how I felt. It was the most excruciating agony I'd ever experienced. Intense pain shot through my entire body. I couldn't help but cry out. Lapsing between consciousness and unconsciousness, I couldn't tell if I was in my body or separate from my body. By the time the doctor reached my middle finger, the Lord mercifully allowed me to faint and not feel the pain being inflicted on me. When I awoke, I had no feeling in either of my hands or fingers. I felt a terrible pain surging through my entire body. Despite the cold weather, I was covered in sweat from head to toe. I understood the dream I had received from God of my red handprints on the white sheets. Later on, Brother Lee told me he didn't know what had happened. Forced to wait outside at the other end of the corridor, he'd heard the doctor shout as he started to torture me. Yan, take your stubborn mind and go see your God. When Brother Lee heard me scream like a wounded animal, he could do nothing but pray for me. So he bowed his head and asked God to preserve my life. After I returned to the cell, the other prisoners asked what was wrong with me. Brother Lee fell on his face and sobbed uncontrollably. When he managed to compose himself, he explained what had taken place. They all felt pity for me. Even those hardened criminals had tears in their eyes when they heard what had happened. Thank God. He protected and preserved me through these trials. I knew that God was using the wrath of evil men to accomplish his purposes in me, to break down my self-centeredness and my stubbornness. He taught me how to wait on him, how to patiently endure hardship, and how to love the family of God in a more real way. After these tortures, I felt just like David had described in Psalms 102, verses 4 to 5. My heart is smitten and withered like grass, so that I forget to eat my bread. By reason of the voice of my groaning, my bones cleave to my skin. Even though the officers and doctor had stabbed me, kicked me, and electrocuted me, they didn't get what they wanted. They were furious. After a few days, they devised a new plan. One morning, I heard the prison gates open. One of the men in my cell climbed up to look out of the window, and he saw a few well-dressed PSB officers enter. They ordered the guards, Bring Yan out! They ordered Brother Lee to wrap my blanket around me and carry me out. A motor tricycle with a sidecar was outside the prison gate waiting to take me to the Nanyang Hospital where a doctor examined me and concluded, Yan does not have any serious medical problems except that he's badly dehydrated. We must give him an IV so fluids can enter his body. 
A nurse prepared two bottles of saline liquid for the IV. I closed my eyes and heard cameras clicking as the nurse inspected my arm. The doctor told the nurse, he's too thin to find a vein. We'll just have to stab the needle into his arm. The doctors and nurses were acting for the reporters and cameramen who had been called in to witness this staged performance. They still couldn't find my vein, so they made me lie down on a bed in the hallway. Many people walked past me and despised me. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. Psalms 22 verses 7 and 8. I was a pitiful and dreadful sight. Like the Apostle Paul said, For I think that God had set forth us, the Apostles, last, as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world, and to angels, and to men. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world, and are the offscouring of all things unto this day. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 9 and 13. Finally, the nurse stabbed the needle into my arm muscle because she was frustrated at not being able to find a vein. The reporters were waiting, and the medical staff had grown flustered by the delay. Two bottles were emptied into the muscle tissue of my arm. Immediately it swelled up and I was in great agony. The doctors and nurses didn't care if I lived or died. They just did the performance for the newspapers to prove that the state had been concerned for me. The authorities were certain I would soon die and had wanted to show that they had tried to help me. I was returned to the prison where another session awaited me in the interrogation room. I closed my eyes, but the officers again forced my eyelids open with their fingers. They played with me and mocked me, but they couldn't make me speak. Two officers took me back to my cell. They threw me onto the cement floor, took away my blanket, and used two electric batons to electrocute and beat me again. It was a dark hour for me. My fellow prisoners had no pity on me this time. Earlier that day, while I was being tortured, prison officers had made a speech to my cellmates telling them, Yun is an evil man, an anti-government criminal, he knows he has committed serious crimes, so now he's pretending to be crazy. But we realize his plan. He has started a hunger strike to make our government look bad. But today, the hospital has diagnosed no sickness. So from this day on, we shall treat him according to his own devices. You prisoners need to be careful of this counter-revolutionary. His presence in your cell has brought bad luck to you all. You should separate yourself from Yun and report if you see something bad in him. Whoever does this, the best will be rewarded with a more lenient sentence. In this way, the other prisoners, except Brother Lee, were taught to hate me so that they could be rewarded. Among the other men in my cell, some were serving life sentences and others sentenced to between 10 and 20 years. They had great hatred in their hearts and the offer of leniency was too much of a reward for them to ignore. From that moment on, it was difficult for me just to stay alive in the cell. If not for God's mercy and protection, 
I would surely have died. There were now 15 or 16 prisoners in our small cell. They all did their excrement in the same toilet. They took my bedding and soaked it in the human waste. The smell was terrible. The cell leader, who had been appointed by the guards, came and deliberately urinated on my face and urged the others to do the same. So all the prisoners, except Brother Lee, constantly urinated on me, laughing and mocking me as they did so. This was a great humiliation, but I was too weak to protest. I suffered in my heart, but I endured silently. I thought of the words from 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 23, speaking of Jesus, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. I also meditated on the promise of Jesus. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice ye in that day, and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven, for in the like manner, did their fathers unto the prophets. Luke chapter 6 verses 22 and 23. The guards also started to treat the other prisoners more cruelly. In this way, the men hated me even more, believing it was my fault that their condition was worsening. Every day at a set time, the other prisoners were allowed to exercise in the yard. One afternoon, I was also carried out to the yard when the guards instructed the men to throw me into a septic tank where the waste of all the prisoners was collected. The guards urinated on me and tried to force me to pass waste. But of course I hadn't eaten for so long that this was impossible. I was fading away almost to nothing. At that time, I weighed about 30 kilograms or 66 pounds. The guards electrocuted me again and again and forced me to crawl like a dog through the human feces. They kicked me with their steel-capped boots, forcing me to roll over into the excrement. They even used their electric batons to stab me inside my mouth. I cannot easily describe the pain this caused. I thought my brain was going to explode. My mind and body shake even today when I think about those experiences. I longed to die to escape the pain. Instead of trying to use my own words to describe how I felt, I simply quote the words of the psalmist. Many bulls have come past me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a pot sherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. Psalms 22, verses 12 through 15. 
I finally lost consciousness. All the other prisoners witnessed these events. The guards wanted them to mock and humiliate me. Some did, but others couldn't handle the scene and wept bitterly. My brother-in-law was in the prison at the same time as me, in a different cell. When he saw my condition, he ran out from the crowd and tried to help me. The guards electrocuted and kicked him, shouting, Who do you think you are? Get out of here! As soon as the current hit his body, he collapsed on the ground. By March 1984, the long winter was coming to an end, and the snow had stopped falling. Although the early mornings were still cold, I was shivering in the cold wind because I wore only rags and torn clothes that had been given to me by the other prisoners. One morning, the time came for the prisoners to go to the toilet, and they all lined up. I was so weak that I couldn't stand, so the guards made me lean against the wall. I recall the night I was arrested, when Brother Zhang, Brother Zen, and the other co-workers had lovingly washed my feet. I remembered the beautiful scarf Zhang gave to me, saying, This scarf will keep you warm from the cold. I felt as if my dear brothers and sisters were always with me, even in prison. I took great comfort as I thought about their sweet fellowship. I still had the scarf Brother Zhang had given me. I wrapped it around my waist to keep warm. In this way, I felt I was still bound together with the believers. That day, I was left alone alongside the wall until sunset. Then Brother Lee was told to pick me up and carry me back to the cell. When I entered, I found the guards had not finished with me yet. They tore the scarf from around my waist. I had a small porcelain teacup from my family, which I had tied to the scarf. Many small blue crosses were painted on the teacup. It had given me strength for a long time. It reminded me of the cross of Jesus and also of my family's love. The prisoners untied the teacup and threw it into the urinal. They also threw my scarf into the human excrement. I felt such pain and anger. Struggling with all my strength, I crawled into the waste to retrieve my teacup. The prisoners urinated on my cup and on my hands. I grabbed my teacup and hugged it closely to my chest. I was so angry that they tried to take away the last remaining earthly possession that was precious to me. I wanted to strike back at them with my words, but the Lord stopped me and told me, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Romans 12, verses 17, 19, and 21. I repented for the way I felt. I started to bless my fellow prisoners, especially those who insulted me the worst. Less than two days later, God's wrath fell upon my cellmates, and they started to itch from scabies. Their skin itched all over so badly that it drove them crazy. Brother Lee and I were the only prisoners speared. Even though I had lain in human waste 
and been subjected to the vilest unsanitary conditions, the Lord made sure I wasn't afflicted by this disease. The guards took every opportunity to watch me for a sign of weakness, but they saw I just lay there on my back and said and did nothing. The prison authorities discovered that Brother Lee had been secretly taking care of me in many ways. He had lovingly prevented the other prisoners from doing more harm to me and had encouraged them to treat me kindly. Consequently, Brother Lee was transferred to another cell. Now, I was alone, without the fellowship of any other believers. The guards took me and threw me into the urinal. The prisoners urinated on my face. I wanted to cry out. Now I felt so alone. Reproach hath broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. And I looked for some to take pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. Psalm 69 and verse 20. The next morning, the other prisoners awoke to find their bodies covered with red welts. They had a condition known as pustule. They couldn't bear the irritations. They scratched their welts until pus oozed out. The afflicted prisoners couldn't sleep or lie down because they were so tormented by their need to itch. The guards came to examine me. They tore off my undergarments to see if I had the disease. They thought the disease had originated from me because I'd spent so much time lying in human waste. They found I was the only prisoner free of the affliction. My cellmates left me alone for a while and concentrated on relieving their own discomfort. The leader of the cell was most badly infected. His whole body was covered in spots, even his face. The other prisoners were afraid to go near him. Because I was disease free, my cellmates moved my bed from next to the urinal to alongside the cell leader to increase my chances of catching the parasites from him. It infuriated the prisoners and the guards that I wasn't suffering the same affliction as the others. One cellmate named Yu had watched me closely for many weeks. He came to me and lovingly covered my body with a blanket and was kind to me. He was a God-given replacement for Brother Lee. One night, you came over to cover me. I reached out and took hold of his arm. I was so weak that my voice was almost unintelligible. He lowered his head to hear my whisper. You, you must receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Right then, you silently received the Lord's salvation. The leader of the cell, who had suffered so much from the disease, hated me even more when he saw I had escaped the affliction. He took my blanket and used it for himself. In its place, he wrapped me in his own disease-ridden blanket, covered in blood, dirt, and pust that had oozed from his sores. But the Lord protected me, and I still did not contract the disease. The devil had attacked and threatened me through many evil men, but the Holy Spirit had made me strong in Jesus even though my outer body was almost totally destroyed. My enemies had all been confounded. The prisoners discussed among themselves how much longer I would live. Some said 
he will die within three days. Others said, he will surely not even last tonight. I bet you he will die by the morning. If he survives the night, I'll give you my man too. In this way, they gambled with each other. But I didn't die. Those who gamble against God's servants will surely lose. I had placed myself in the hands of the Lord of Justice. I was no longer living by my own strength, but by the grace of God. The PSB were unable to extract any confession from my mouth to use against me. They were afraid that if I died, they would have to give an account to the provincial authorities, so they were nervous. The prison arranged for several nurses from the hospital to come. They used a tool to open my mouth and a bottle to force feed soup to me. But I refused to swallow and let it run down onto the floor. Photographers were present. They took pictures as evidence that the authorities had done everything they could to save me. When the guards saw that I let the soup run down to the floor, they mocked me and said, Yun, we no longer care if you live or die. We couldn't care less. We have done everything possible to help you. You thought your hunger strike would affect our government, but now we hope that you die. When you die, it will be announced as suicide. We'll take your body and cremate it. We'll be glad to be rid of you, you stubborn man. The end of chapter 10 of The Heavenly Man by Paul Hathaway.